Alexander Ovechkin is back on track, but the Washington Capitals continue to be up and down. What will they do at the trade deadline? Plus, the Vegas Golden Knights are the defending Stanley Cup champions, but they are struggling mightily. Can they right the ship? And the Montreal Canadiens are having a different approach to the trade deadline. We'll discuss all this and more on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Gil Martin here and welcome everybody to the Monday edition of the Locked On NHL podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone for making Locked On NHL your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you can get new episodes as soon as they drop. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. It is great to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On Capitals, Dan Holmey. And Dan, never a dull moment with the Capitals right now. What, what's going on? One game they look like they could be cup contenders and another game, in fact, sometimes the very next game, they look a little lost out there on the ice. What's going on? So it has been an up and down season for the Capitals, for sure. Uh, This team is much like a pendulum. One minute they win, the next minute they lose. And it's hard to gauge the trajectory of this team. You know, I take a look at the last game against the Flyers, and I was riding the high. I was drinking the Capitals Kool-Aid. But then, you know, I take a look at the game where they fell on their face against the Red Wings. And then they picked up a big win against the Senators. And then they lose to the lowly Coyotes. So to say I know what this team is going to do from one game to the next, uh, I think I would have to get into fortune telling in order to do that. But uh, I think that ultimately that is why you see the Capitals in the position that they're at now. And ultimately why I think the Capitals will be sellers at the deadline that we'll talk about a little bit later in the show. But um, an up and down season. Uh, The thing that I like about it is the integration of youth. Uh, This team is one of the older teams roster-wise in the NHL, but they're getting young, and they're getting younger based on necessity. You saw what happened with Kuznetsov. We'll talk about later. Nick Backstrom, um, TJ Oshie, who's injured. So this aging core uh, is slowly peeling off and going away. So you're seeing the integration of Hendrix LaPierre and Connor McMichael that despite the outcome of this season, I think – that the Capitals will be a good team in years to come. But at this point, and I, again, like I talked about, it's the pendulum that swings back and forth. The inconsistency is what has me worried. I think that to a lot of Capitals fans, we want to cling on that they can do it. But with a loss, a decisive loss to the Coyotes today, it draws everything into question for me. Talk to me a little about Alex Ovechkin. Slow start, obviously, to the seasons. Kind of picked things up a little bit recently. Where is he at, and and what do you think the big reason is for the down decline, basically, in his statistics? Well, decline, I mean, if I'm going to generalize the season overall, but uh, he is a changed man uh, after the All-Star break. Uh, I think that uh, he found his game when he was riding around on a camel in Dubai with his wife and kids during the All-Star break. And uh, he came back and he said that, you know, I put hockey in the rear view. I didn't think about hockey. I didn't do anything about hockey. And uh, I think that that is what really helped him out. Um, And it it reinvigorated him when he came. uh, He was a changed man and has actually uh, is projected now to get 20 or 25 goals on the season. And uh, if memory serves before the all star break, he had nine goals. Uh, Now, listen, this is a far cry from a 40 or 50 goal season that we're used to from the grade eight. But it's interesting that uh, he can turn on the Jets that when he wants to, and much like a lot of his teammates said, don't ever discount him. Don't ever count out Alex Ovechkin because he'll prove you wrong every single time. Absolutely. I've, I've seen it so many times over the course of his illustrious career. Let's talk about the Kuznetsov situation. Uh, he obviously, you placed on waivers earlier this week, cleared waivers. What happens next for Evgeny Kuznetsov? And I'm assuming he's played his last game with the Washington Capitals. 
Well, according to Elliot Friedman during the broadcast today of the game, uh, it was said that he cleared waivers. And from the press conference yesterday, GM Brian McClellan said that the plan is to send him to Hershey. Now, I've heard through some channels, you know, not super official, uh, that uh, he has said that uh, if he if he's getting sent down to Hershey, that uh, that's beneath him. There's no way that he will play AHL hockey. Uh, if that is the case, potentially that could terminate his contract. Uh, and then that would open up possibilities for him to pursue different teams in the NHL or uh, potentially to uh, play back in his homeland of Russia. Uh, you know, to a certain extent, I wonder if Brian McClellan kind of judged what kind of person Evgeny Kuznetsov is, knowing that if I put him on waivers, he's not going to play down there anyway. And guess what? Kaching kaching, we get some more money to spend because as it stands right now, uh, he if he does play for the Hershey Bears, he will be the most expensive AHLer in the entire American Hockey League. So uh, as far as Evgeny Kuznetsov goes, uh, two times he's been in the Players Assistance Program. Uh, ultimately, Evgeny Kuznetsov, the man, the husband, the guy outside of hockey, I wish him nothing but the best, but he's got to get his game together. Uh, he's got to get his personal life together. And, uh, you know, you take a look at Anthony Mantha. Sometimes don't discount these guys because last summer I said, Anthony Mantha's done, uh, you know, just do whatever it takes to get him out of here. And what did he do this year? He scored 20 goals. Uh, so the same thing for Kuzi, you know, potentially he is a first round draft pick in 2010 uh, that potentially he could find a home somewhere else. It's interesting just briefly here talking about uh, Barry Trotz. Now the GM of the Nashville Predators, he was all in on Kuzi last summer. Um, but it didn't come out. It would, it would have been a deal that would have sent to Duchesne to the Capitals, which would have been a nice return, but ultimately it fell apart. So obviously there are, you know, uh, teams out there that see some intrinsic qualities in them. Uh, it's just that I think they want to see those qualities without the big cap hit. So the, the trade deadline is now less than a week away. You hinted earlier that you think the Capitals will be sellers. If that's true, who do you think they would be looking to move? Who's available if they're if they're selling at the deadline? Well, Brian McClellan made it very clear yesterday that he's not going to just dump players to dump players, despite the fact that you hear Friedman and Sarah Volley and they have all these names that they have circled of players on the move. He's like, listen, if we can get a young player like Erasmus Sandin last year, uh, then we'll do it. But we're not going to just dump guys to dump guys. Uh, he also mentioned that we're not going to be into rentals, of course, if the perception is that the Capitals are out of it, why would you need a rental? Uh, but there are some intriguing names that I've heard out there. I've heard Noah Hannafin. I've heard uh, different names like that, that potentially uh, that uh, could be on the move there. Um, and would Noah Hannafin make the Capitals that much better? Of course. Uh, what would the ask be? Everything I've heard is a first round pick uh, and some other draft picks plus some NHL players. So uh, as far as names on the move, you know, the big ones are Anthony Mantha. He's going to be an unrestricted free agent this summer. Uh, Max Pacioretty, who has uh, a limited team amount of teams he will go to. Joel Edmondson, who the Capitals picked up last summer, who Montreal is retaining 50% of his salary. That would be, uh, you know, good for another team. Also, Nicolas Abe Cubel, Nick Dowd, that one would hurt quite a bit. He is a huge, huge player. Any team that he goes to is already going to get that much better. And Nick Jensen as well. Uh, we, we saw some gaps in his defense today. I've heard that Toronto uh, is all in on Nick Jensen. And the other one not listed on here that's been rumored, even though it's it's out there, is Charlie Lindgren, the outlaw, uh, because there's one year left on his deal. Uh, he is a backup netminder, but plays a lot better than a lot of teams starting netminders. But my hunch is they hold on to Chucky sideburns until the summer, the draft, that kind of thing, where they can maximize the return. The, the Capitals can demand the King's ransom for Charlie Lindgren, and they very well might get it. We shall see. And what, do you, what are they looking to get back? I know getting younger is one thing, but is there a position that they're looking more to emphasize? Absolutely. Like I talked about earlier, the Erasmus Sandin was the, you know, uh, we remember that Hathaway and Orloff went out to Boston in return. We got some draft picks. We sent that draft picked up to Toronto. We got Sandin. So that helped the Capitals blue line for the present and the future. They want to do something similar to that this year, where if they move out, say someone like a Mantha or a Dow, they get some good draft picks that they can in turn flip to get that forward. 
uh, this year. Instead of a blue liner, get a forward this year uh, because that is what this team wants to do. They're trending in the direction of getting younger. So if they can get someone like Erasmus Sandin, except for a forward, that's ultimately what they're looking for. Uh, as far as the Capitals uh, at the trade deadline, you take a look at Anthony Mantha. Are you going to trade Anthony Mantha for an Anthony Mantha type player? Is that a win? Uh, that seems kind of crazy and nicked out as well. My hunch is, is that you will see some bundling going on together. Anthony Mantha by himself, I don't know how much that's going to yield, but say you took Mantha plus Nick Dow together, you could get a pretty handsome return on a deal like that. All right, Dan, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media? Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter or X at Locked On Caps and also me personally at Dan Caps 218. Of course, the podcast is available wherever you find your podcast and on YouTube, including the Sirius XM app. All right, Dan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live, same game parlays, exclusive prop bets, and more. And look, it's not just the NBA. You've got college basketball. You've got hockey. And of course, baseball spring training underway right now. Check out the odds for your favorite hockey team now on FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. It is great to welcome back to the show the co-host of Locked On Vegas Golden Knights, Chris Golick. And uh, Chris, kind of a, a crazy time right now for the defending Stanley Cup champions. What is the root cause of the team's recent struggles? Cassidy made a great point. I think we're going back to a couple Thursdays ago the home game against the Toronto Maple Leafs when Toronto came to Vegas and I think it was a six to two final in favor of Toronto. It was an awful game, just seven to three, seven, to, whatever it was, it was a bad game. Who cares what the score was? Um, but after the game, Cassidy talked about the Golden Knights are becoming easy to play against and that they've lost their identity to a degree. I don't look at that as Jack Eichel and Mark Stone being injured. I don't. I think that's an excuse. I think that's a crutch. Maybe that's a bad pun given the injuries, but I just think that is an excuse that doesn't need to be made. Yes, Eichel and Stone would be important to any of the 32 National Hockey League teams. You take Dreisaitl and McDavid away from Edmonton, obviously things would change, and we can do that with all the teams in the National Hockey League. But they're just not, I don't know if it, I don't want to say effort or heart. These are professionals. They're out there working their butts off every game, but just attention to detail, puck management. The defense is healthy, but not getting it done. And uh, the goaltending has been poor, putting it very mildly and um, PC, I guess. So, how do you address that if you're coaching or, or if you're the general manager of this team? What shakes them up and gets them back on track? Because you know, Vegas has always been a team that wears their opponents down and that that effort that you spoke about has always been a key to their success. They're opportunistic. They score well off the rush. When they had more of their players not injured, they were getting the cycle going and finding other creative ways to score. A lot of that, of course, has gone away due to the injuries. Um, <clears throat> Cassidy, number one, and he's been driving this home in pregame and postgame, in-game and every other opportunity he can practice as well. Puck management has been borderline abysmal. It's been bad. And it's not the rookies out there making mistakes. The first goal last night against the Buffalo Sabres, Brisson loses, rookie, young kid, Brisson loses a battle, but William Carlson is the one who gets his pocket picked, and now the Sabres are up one nothing. Um, on another goal, you have Alec Mar or I think it was McNabb and Petrangelo, who are normally not even out there together. Neither one is clearing the crease. You have other situations where Shea Theodore 
who's been a very good bright spot since his return, just coughs a puck over at the offensive blue line, leads to a shorthanded breakaway. So these aren't issues caused by missing your star players. These are just little snafus that the players are having, making bad decisions with the puck, not winning their battles, not just, like I said, the attention to detail. And then you asked if I was McCrimmon how I address this. I mean, there's what I would do if I was McCrimmon, and then there's what McCrimmon is going to do because he's McCrimmon. And I don't see McCrimmon as a type to sit still and just um, let the situation fix itself. I don't see him sitting on a lot of LTIR money when and if, if and when Mark Stone gets moved there this week. You met, let, Let's stay on the injuries for a little bit. When are some of these players coming back, or are, are most of them done for the season at this point? Mark Stone, the reports are regular, and not from VGK to the best of my knowledge, but the reports from various sources, uh, Mark Stone, regular season, iffy for the playoffs, if at all. That's a huge blow right there. Irreplaceable piece on the bench. I don't care what they do coming up at the trade deadline. Jack Eichel is borderline ready to go. He's been in a regular contact jersey, I want to say going back to Wednesday of last week. Um, participated in the pregame skate Thursday, participated in the pregame skate Saturday, and uh, any practices in between in a regular sweater. Um, I think it's even money or better. Eichel will return a tomorrow, uh, Monday against the Columbus Blue Jackets to at least have him ready for a huge game Thursday against the Canucks. Um, other injury updates, Pavel Dorofiev, there's absolutely no update from Cassidy. No no progression was the update from Cassidy, pardon me. Feels like a concussion situation that's just not improving, very unfortunate. Um, Will Carrier, I thought, has been closer, but we haven't seen him. Like All the players have been skating on their own. All the injuries, Ben Hutton, uh, Dorofiev, Will Carrier. Obviously, we talked about Jack Eichel a second ago. Besides Mark Stone, this was before the Mark Stone injury, this update came out. So there should be reinforcements coming, right? You would hope. As far as the trade deadline goes, it's less than a week away now. What do you expect this team to do? You know, if some of these guys are close to coming back, like Jack Eichel, does that make them hedge their bets? Or does this team need to be shaken up a little bit? I'm glad you said hedge your bets because it brought my poker analogy back. I used this uh, last week on Lockdown VGK, but... Last season, the situation with Mark Stone was a little different, kind of the same, but a little bit different in the sense that I don't think Stone has a path to coming back at all this calendar season, even if the Golden Knights go all the way to the cup final. But last season, the team was very close, it felt, this time. There's been a lot of regression, unfortunately, this year since the All-Star break, which is very odd compared to what happened last season. But last year, I felt McCrimmon was, using a Texas Hold'em reference, drawing to a flush or drawing to an outside an outside straight, where about 25, 28, 30% of the time, you're going to make your hand and you're going to win the pot, right? Well, in this case, the, the pot is the Stanley Cup, and obviously McCrimmon made his hand and won the pot and won the Stanley Cup. This year at the trade deadline, I think he's drawing to more of like an inside straight, where there's only four cards in the deck that can help your hand. And even if he makes his hand, I still don't think he drags the pot. Of course, we're referencing the Stanley Cup again. I think the odds are much different and stacked against the Golden Knights. And, you know, there's Busnevich, there's Riley Smith, there's Jake Gensel, who's had the most discussions. There's Vladimir Tarasenko. I don't think I don't think there's a word. I grew up a White Sox fan. Still, I'm a White Sox fan. We had Kenny Williams as the general manager for a long time. And. McCrimmon never meant, or sorry, well, McCrimmon too, but uh, Ken Williams never met a free agent or a big trade acquisition he wasn't afraid to pursue or go after. I think Kelly McCrimmon has a lot of that in him as well. The core is good, right? There's a lot of great players on this team, all of which are Stanley Cup champions based on, with the exception of some of the kids who have been getting some time. So I think McCrimmon will be aggressive. I think he's going to go for not one, but two pieces. Jake Gensel concerns me with his injury situation, not going to be even ready to go until after the trade deadline passes this week. For my money, if there's a way to get Riley Smith and then one of Busnevich or Tarasenko, I think that would give the Golden Knights a chance to repeat. But the goaltending and the defense, we'll see if that gets any better. 
and what would they be willing to part with to to acquire some of these players? Can I say F those picks? <laughs> um, I mean, listen, the Golden Knights and draft picks, um, it's it's kind of odd looking on cap friendly. The Golden Knights actually have their first, second, and third for the next three years. So that's a, a very un something not normal. But outside of that, there's been a lot of players from the AHL getting a lot of time. Brennan Brisson is the team's probably uh probably their best prospect as far as the closest to being an NHL already player. Scored his second goal of the season last night. Power play goal. Very good one-timer from the right circle. Uh, Luke Cormier, defenseman, getting a lot more time uh, down in Henderson. Did play a few games. Another highly rated prospect. Um, you got players like Mason Morelli and Sheldon Rempal getting some time, but they're more like on the fourth line. I don't see them as possibly players who are desirable in a, in a trade, at least for a big trade. Um, that leaves a couple of players like Caden Korzak, who played – a lot of time with the Golden Knights throughout the season. And then as the Golden Knights defense returned to health, he got kind of shoved back down to the AHL. And then Daniel Miramanov. Miramanov, a puck moving mobile defenseman who can score. Pardon me, who can score. And I think the Golden Knights were showcasing him for a couple of weeks because there were some other players on the roster, like Caden Korzak mainly, who I felt should have been getting the minutes, but then there's things like waivers you have to consider and all that stuff too. So we'll see. All right. Should be interesting to see what happens by the end of the week. Chris, why don't you tell our viewers and listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you and your co-host on social media. Yep. Locked on Vegas Golden Knights, anywhere you get your podcast. We do the YouTube uh, as well, Monday through Friday, Saturday, me and my son, Christopher, we have our own Locked on VGK uh, every Saturday morning. That's a YouTube exclusive. You can find me on Twitter at TD Chris G. That's like touchdown TD Chris G. All right, Chris, thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Oh, definitely. We'll see. Uh, I'm curious how what's going to be the next time we meet and, and what we're going to be talking about. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They've got killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, and their best price guarantee. So Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. My favorite feature on Game Time is that you can go on the app and see the view from your seat before you buy the tickets. So you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And Game Time has deals on tickets not only up to the start of the event, but often even an hour after it starts. It is the place to find last-minute tickets. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Just download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off, download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the co host of Locked On Canadiens, Laura Saba. And uh, Laura, been a little bumpy ride lately for the Habs. They've come close in a lot of games. What's been the difference between the last few weeks and the beginning part of the season? So the Canadians, honestly, they've been losing a lot of games and that's, you know, that's the reality of the standings. Uh, but if you look a little bit closer, um, the underlying numbers are getting a lot better. So they're playing much better five on five. And I'd say now we're in a maybe 15 game stretch where that's what they're doing. They're losing the game, which is what you want because you want the higher draft pick, but their even strength play is getting better. Um, and I know we're going to get into that in a little bit of, in the next segment, but there's a couple of key players that are stepping up uh, that are improving. So overall, uh, I would say the last 15 games are infinitely better than the maybe 20 or 30 games before that, uh, because in that uh, scenario, like previously, what was happening was they would, come out of the gate they'd be able to get to a lead or they might hang with a good team let's say maybe they don't have the lead but they're hanging with the team but one thing would go wrong and then everything would unravel it would either be a weak penalty kill or a power play that didn't deliver or an easy goal that was let in or something like that 
and then everything would come off the rails and the Habs would not be able to regroup. Like there were a lot of games and there were like maybe five or six in a row even where they would give up a two, three, even four goal lead sometimes. So there is like, so there is a little, a lot of improvement to the way that they're playing on the ice, but they're still struggling with a lot of injuries. That's, that's the, that's another key p- component of this season is this is a third year in a row of a, a disproportionate number of injuries. Um, and obviously everything's not hunky dory, right? But their five on five play is much better. Like their special teams are still struggling. The defense isn't necessarily uh, playing a cohesive way. You know, they're sort of scraping by, by the skin of their teeth, but their top line is performing, which is why you're getting a lot more uh, of those high danger chances, which is why your underlying numbers are showing the Canadians are playing better, but uh, like they're losing a lot of games, a lot. And the last couple were in a shootout. They, they won against Arizona and then there were a few losses before that, but the trend is encouraging. All right, so who are some of these players that are making Martin St. Louis feel a little bit better about the long-term <laughs> situation here in Montreal? I think the key one, I will talk about Suzuki in a second, but the key improvement is that uh, Uri, I almost called him Yaroslav, Uri Slavkovsky um, has stepped up in a big way. This is his breakout year. This year you're seeing all the things the Canadians saw in him when they drafted him first overall. His on-ice awareness has improved dramatically since last season because last season, it's not like he wasn't trying. He also wasn't on the top line with Nick Suzuki. He wasn't being played, I think, in the situations that we wanted to see him in. But his awareness has increased dramatically. His on-ice presence uh, every, every single shift he's delivering. He's playing physically physically he's playing intelligently he's playing with speed and he's showing his skill and he's not afraid to use his body whereas before I feel like you know last year there was a little bit of immaturity to that he was a little bit reckless he was still playing physically that like that was you know but it was it was a bit reckless it was a bit you know he he got injured so many times there were a lot of keep your head up kid moments but he's really really broken out and he has been the key to the power play improving. It's not dramatically improved. They didn't go from like 32nd to the first or whatever, but they were, I think, 29th. And now they're middle of the pack. You know, they're they're hovering around 15, 16, like uh, generally speaking, that's their trend. And he's been the key. Like he's been the threat that they've been able to offer on that power play. So he's one of them. And then Nick Suzuki, if you look at his numbers this year, he's having a Selkie caliber year. Right. He's always stepping up like he has. He's still breaking records. He's still, you know, uh, he's still Nick Suzuki. He's still improving every little bit of his game every single day. But it's really like the defensive aspect of his game has added another layer to it. And his numbers truly are showing that this kid is he's he's got that defensive two way center potential in the future. So we're less than a week away now from the NHL trade deadline. You mentioned that the Canadians want to improve their draft position. Who are some of the players that they may be looking to deal at the trade deadline? And what are they looking to get in return? So the players that I think they have to offer, uh, whether or not that that is for the good or not, uh, definitely... David Savard, they like him a lot, but they are entertaining calls on him. Uh, absolutely, Yoel Armia, whose co- contract is a little bit of a deterrent, but it's like a new guy, you know, after two years of him struggling, all of a sudden this season he's back and he's earning that contract, so he's another one. Uh, obviously, they won't be able to uh, unload an injured guy's contract because this is not the time for it, so Christian Dvorak is out of the question. Uh, Jake Allen, they're still taking calls on him. Uh, I don't know what calls have been coming in, to be honest, but they are still listening. Um, and then uh, who was my key? Oh, Josh Anderson. Yes, that was the one where right. they would love to unload that contract, but he's struggling a lot. So I don't necessarily see a GM take him on unless they believe, you know, I can fix him. 
uh, right. unless they have that mentality. So I, I believe everybody's kind of on the trading block for the right price. The thing with Kent Hughes, though, is that he has proven that if you don't give him the price he wants, he just won't make the trade. Like he's not going to trade just because that's what he's going to get, right? Like he's decided, he's looked at your team, he either wants a specific pick or he wants a prospect he's got an eye on. And if he's not getting that, he's not making that deal. You go find your goaltender elsewhere. You go find your, you know, uh, shot blocking defenseman elsewhere. So I, I really don't necessarily think that, uh, like Montreal Canadiens fans, let me put it this way. Montreal Canadiens fans are not expecting a whole lot of fireworks at the trade deadline. Everybody, every piece that moves for us is like, it's like a cherry on the top because we know that it's going to be tough. And we also know a lot of these players, they, they still have at least a year left on their contract. So it is possible that they don't get dealt now, but Kent Hughes has something uh, in the works for the NHL draft. Now that said, we are recording this on Sunday night. Uh, we also have recorded our own show already. Uh, I fully expect that at eight o'clock in the morning, which is when Kent Hughes likes to drop these bombs, there will be a trade announced somewhere, which is kind of what happened with the, with Monaghan. I think it was nine thirty. It wasn't eight yeah. o'clock, but it was pretty early. Um, but this is what he likes to do all the time. So. Um, I think Sean Monaghan was their biggest uh, prize that they had to trade. Um, and uh, for very good reason, he's, you know, he's been phenomenal despite being injury prone. He's really fixed a lot of problems on the Canadians. So, you know, good luck to him on the Jets. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think everybody pretty much like every he'll entertain calls on everybody. The only untouchables I would say at this point are like Gooley, uh, Suzuki, Caulfield, Slavkovsky. That's pretty much it. I, I think he'll even like even the guys he just traded for, you know, like like Alex Newhook or whatever. He'll take calls on everybody. But if you don't pay the right price, he's just he's just going to hang up the phone. And, and what are they looking to add? Is it mostly picks or they're, yes. if they're adding prospects, what position would they be looking to fortify? So in terms of picks, I think they want as many as possible because they're getting close to that point where they're no longer going to be picking in the top 10 like this year. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure it's a lock that they're going to pick in the top 10 and they even have a shot at the top five, but um, they're getting close. So they, they want to stockpile as many picks as possible in the next couple of drafts. Uh, when it comes to prospects, it's really interesting because they seem to fall in love with a player rather than want to fill a need, which is, which is kind of how they, the opposite of how they approach the draft. Like the draft, it was like, well, we need defense and goaltenders. So we'll just pick defense and goaltenders and we don't care who's a better forward that's out there. Uh, but in terms of like who they want to who, who they want in return, like they they have a very specific type of player that they like. Uh, uh, they the guy played at Northeastern, like for sure. He's like you know, I uh, know that, that's that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but they're like it feels like they fall in love with players rather than filling a need. But what I would like to see them do is pick up middle six players and um, a little bit of. Uh, I would say like maybe middle or bottom pairing defensemen because there's a lot that's made of like the Habs lacking elite talent. Well, with the players that you have to trade, you're not getting elite prospects back in return, but you could get solid, like promising middle six, middle pairing defensemen or forwards. All right, Laura, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media? Uh, so I am one of the co-hosts of Locked On Canadians. You can find Locked On Canadians anywhere you get your podcast as well as on YouTube. We are on Twitter at, at LO underscore Canadians, and I'm on all social media at The Active Stick. Thank you so much, Gil. Hey, thank you, Laura. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now... It's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. I want to thank uh, my guests today. I want to thank Dan Holmey of Locked On Capitals, Chris Garlick of Locked On Vegas Golden Knights, and Laura Saba of Locked On Canadiens. I'm Gil Martin. I host the Monday edition of Locked On NHL, and I also co-host the Friday edition along with Rachel Donner. Big week ahead, everybody. So with the trade deadline just a few days away, 
Stay with Locked On NHL every day. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, bringing you the biggest stories from around the NHL. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe, and thanks so much for listening to and watching the Locked On NHL podcast.